Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We just want to wait a few minutes to allow others to join the webinar. So we plan on starting in about another five or six minutes. Thank you very much. Well, I think we're going to get started. Uh, good morning, and I'm sure for others, it's probably good afternoon or good evening. My name is Marjorie Jean-Pierre, and I'm a senior director at the United States Energy Association. We are pleased that you were able to join us for our webinar, A Practical Guide to Asset Recovery and Circular Economy for Electric Utilities. This program is part of the Advancing Modern Power Through Utility Partnerships AMP Up program managed by the U.S. Energy Association and financed by the U.S. Agency for International Development. You'll hear more about the AMPA program during the remarks made by Ms. Kristen Mather. For those unfamiliar with USDA, our goal is to convene, educate, and provide a nonpartisan forum for the energy industry. Internationally, USDA supports energy development by expanding access to safe, affordable, and sustainable energy in partnership with the U.S. government. For many years, USDA has collaborated with US Agency for International Development to provide capacity building assistance to our overseas partners for increased energy security and access by providing them with programs that encourage the sharing of global best practices and exposure to latest developments, including private sector engagement, market-based approaches to utility operations and management, implementation of regulations, and environmental safeguards. The US Energy Association and collaboration with an incredible consortium of organizations will be managing a new initiative with USDA, USAID, my apologies, which is the Advancing Modern Power with the Utility Partnerships Program. The consortium is comprised of Arizona State University, MK Advisors, and RECA International and Segura Consulting. The program was developed to introduce an innovative performance based models centered around peer-to-peer -peer relationships and strong practitioner and stakeholder networks. 
This webinar on circular economy is being led by Arizona State University and is the first of others to be presented under the AMP Up Technology webinar series. The series will highlight current energy issues being discussed implemented globally and will be led by each AMP Up consortium member. Our next webinar will be held on Monday, December 12th on climate risk management, key lessons from US utilities, and we hope that you will once again be able to join us. Again, thank you for attending our webinar today. I'll have the pleasure of introducing Kristen Madler, who will be representing USAID, and Dr. Nathan Johnson of Arizona State University. Dr. Johnson will be our moderator for the webinar and will introduce our wonderful panel of presenters. At the conclusion of all the presentations, we will conduct a short three question poll before proceeding to our Q&A session. For the Q&A, please either raise your hand to ask a question or submit it in the chat and it will be forwarded to the moderator. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Kristen Madler, Clean Energy Coordinator, Energy Division, Center for Environment, Energy and Infrastructure, EEI, Bureau for Development, Democracy and Innovation at the US Agency for International Development. Kristen, welcome. Thank you so much, Marjorie. And welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, we all know that global climate change goals cannot be achieved without an energy sector transformation of unprecedented scale. And making the needed changes at speed to support the energy transition is possible, provided that we shift toward a more circular economy. And these strategies include improved recycling, use of recycled materials, and design for second life and disassembly. The circular economy is a system which aims to get the most out of materials, keep products and materials in use for as long as possible, and to use cradle to cradle design thinking to cycle materials back into the economy, eliminating waste. And it is a vital pillar of the energy transition. Now over 70% of the world's GDP is covered by a net zero target, with many economies aiming to decarbonize by 2050, including some USAID partners such as Colombia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And other emerging markets have set targets soon after, such as India, by 2070. So a rapid system-wide change in how we live and work is imperative to achieve these net zero goals. And utilities have an opportunity to play a key role in the development of a circular economy. Many of the technological developments that could accelerate circularity are within their sphere of operations, including innovations in materials composition, efficiency, and electrification. And recent reporting discussions at the COP and similar meetings are moving towards voluntary emission reporting, and mandatory reporting and likely eventually will go in the direction of regulation on embodied carbon. So today we'll hear from utilities and business experts that are examining strategic business planning and the use of resources with new perspectives. We look forward to sharing approaches that demonstrate how circularity is providing a useful lens to consider strategic options ensuring that resources are used with more care and when possible treated as assets with cradle to cradle value. And please stay tuned for more technical webinars from AMP UP in the coming weeks as we continue to aim to strengthen the next generation of global skilled workers in the electric power industry. Thanks again for joining and I will turn it back over to you. Perfect, thanks so much, Kristen. And welcome everyone uh, to join us today. I've really appreciated the topic of circular economy as it's it's growing over time. And now as we look and embark on the global energy transition that Kristen was uh, outlining for us, we need to create a fundamental new approach for the way we track resources, allocate resources, and then look at resilience uh, with respect to natural disasters, um, COVID-induced supply chain shocks, and other uh, seemingly externalities that are now affecting our everyday businesses and lives. And to complement what Kristen was kindly sharing on uh, climate change mitigation and reduction, it's also an understanding and awareness of not just the carbon produced uh, through the production and utilization of fossil fuels, but then also the embedded carbon in all of the assets that we use, own and operate to provide that reliable low cost power. 
and then reducing the cost of those assets or avoiding costs uh, in, in some ways by reuse and refurbishment of once used, lightly used, or second used assets. Uh, furthermore, with um, the uh, repair and refurbishment of those assets, then increasing warehouse stores in the event of uh, supply chain shocks or, for example, severe weather, where we need to have more resources immediately on hand and we cannot wait for production to catch up in the event of uh, hurricanes, floods, or other forms of natural disaster. Um, the other aspect that I really appreciate about the transition to the circular economy and how that supports the transition to a low carbon and no carbon economy is it also has a significant opportunity to uh, create jobs, much like the renewable energy industry has as well. And that's in utilities, yes, and then also in supporting entities, contractors, recycling firms, and more, just as we've seen emerge and increase and then stabilize with lead acid batteries and now moving into other storage chemistries. And today's webinar is very much more on focus of uh, not the individual uh, energy assets, but more so the utility uh, technologies. And so to, to think about that lens for circular economy um, in this new area, uh, it's, it's very uh, great to have two speakers from Arizona State University here to talk about motivations and concept of circular economy and then Salt River Project to kindly speak upon uh, transformers of which there is a global shortage right now and various other grid connected systems and then speakers from uh, NG Energy Access about solar home systems and mini grids. And what you'll gain from that variety of perspectives is um, different needs, different approaches, different markets, all uh, creating a new form of business model, a new form of resource management, a new form of job growth, and a new way by which we can provide low cost, reliable, and, and uh, resilient energy. And the other thing that I appreciate by having uh, colleagues on the, on, the home, on the phone today is that these experts in their, in their different areas and realms will provide very specific ways to get started and then accelerate. And I say those two things with great importance because as the, the climate is moving fast, we can't simply wait and watch and think about how we're going to catch up. We need to start moving and then we need to accelerate our plans. And you'll hear that thread throughout our conversation today. And hopefully from today's conversation, you'll get some actionable elements to then take uh, uh, in, into your own actions and systems. And then also we're always welcome to follow up dialogue as well. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, welcome colleagues at Arizona State University to come off mute uh, and uh, come on video. And so Raj Bush is a business development director with the Walton Sustainability Solutions Service. And Hatendra Chaturvedi is a professor of practice with WP Carey Supply Chain Management, also at Arizona State University. Please take it away. Thanks, Nate. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, from wherever you're joining us. Um, let me get going here with the slides. Can you see this? Can everybody see this? Looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to, to quickly uh, go through what we're going to talk about for the next uh, several minutes with Hitendra and I, I'm going to go through the impacts of the linear economy and where we're headed today. I'm going to briefly talk about the circular economy. Uh, and talk a little bit about the systems thinking aspects that uh, Nate uh, alluded to. And then Hitendra is going to talk about the challenges for circularity, the good news around circularity, and then I'm going to wrap up with some examples. So really our unsustainable linear economy, everybody on the call probably understands this, but just to capture it, we assume we have infinite resources to extract from the planet. We take those resources, we make products, we distribute them to all corners of the planet, and then we generate waste, and we assume that the planet has infinite capacity to regenerate those resources. But what does that actually look like, uh, ultimately? So we are at, currently extracting much faster than we are regenerating, about 70%, or around the number about two Earths. So we're, we're consuming at the rate of about two Earths at, at this time. And what does that do to uh, to the planet in terms of sustainability? Social impact wise, a very simple slide that shows you that about half the planet's population, about three and a half to four billion people are living on less than $5 a day. 
And if you look at climate and biodiversity impacts, um, you can see on this screen, obviously I'm not gonna go through all these numbers, but anywhere from two to three times worse to up to 10 times worse, uh, depending on the aspects you're looking at. So there's biodiversity and heat, sea level rise, and then you got ecosystems and crop yields of all things. You know, the, the food system is substantially affected, the oceans and, and species around the, around the planet. So those are our sustain, uh, social and environmental impacts. And our trajectory, where are we headed? At the current rate of consumption of the planet, we're, we're going to need three oats by 2050. By the time we hit 10 billion people, we're, uh, up, we're consuming it at that fast rate. So the circular economy, what is it? Well, Kristen talked a little bit about it, Nate did, uh, but the concept started about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, it's just a different way to verbalize or label sustainability. But the idea is uh, this diagram on the right, which was created by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the left side of the diagram are the biological cycles, uh, the right side are the uh, technical nutrients and technical cycles or the man-made cycles, if you will, human-made. Um, and the basically the principles are the prin uh, to preserve and enhance natural capital, optimize resource yields, and really, I think the mo most important one is to foster system effectiveness. And what does that mean? Um, so when you look at system effectiveness, we, we're all familiar with what a system is, but in technical terms, it's parts, relationships, organization, and boundaries. We know all the parts of a car, but until they're actually assembled and put together in the form of a car, uh, we cannot have a mobility device like we do uh, in a car. And what is systems thinking? So if anybody's heard the story of the blind man and the elephant, um, all the blind men you see in the picture, they, uh, they can imagine the elephant as different objects. And in reality, obviously it's a different uh, system. And the purpose of this, this, the point here is that in an organization, different departments are like the blind men. And in the, in the case of an electric system or a large scale, regional or a national system, the blind men are uh, different organizations, different entities. They see the system differently. And until you come up with a holistic approach, uh, that's, you know, you, you don't fully understand the system. And it goes back to Nate's point about the importance of collaboration uh, and network building within a region and even globally. So, what is circular design and, and how do you bring make system effect make the more system more effective? Ellen MacArthur Foundation IDEO created this uh, uh, circular design guide and the four steps are understand, define, make, and release. You can see the text on the left here. But the, the main idea is to holistically evaluate the system so that you can identify opportunities for leverage, opportunities for intervention, uh, and redesign that system for circularity. I think the most important point is people think that circularity is better recycling or better repurposing or reusing of products. And that's a, that's a very important initial step. But the, really the more important about, point about circularity is that you reevaluate the entire system and you think about the reverse logistics uh, of recovering those materials and maximizing value as intentionally and actively as you would the linear system of, of building the original value chain. And then finally, if you're gonna uh, develop a circular economy, you can go from linear to circular uh, and still not have the kind of social impact we need to have around the planet. And if you create a circular economy and take the sustainable development goals in mind, then you've got a fully holistic circular economy design. And with that, I'm gonna that the tender share. You can go ahead. Thank you, Raj. And let me see if I can uh, share my desktop. Just one second. I'm assuming you're able to see. Looks great. Uh, fantastic. <clears throat> so Raj and me, we are going to play the 
the yin and the yang role here. He talks about circularity. And uh, as we say in North America, that uh, we should not be drinking our own Kool-Aid. It tastes absolutely pathetic, but we drink it because we have been pitching it um, and we, we created it. So in this part of the presentation, what I want to talk about really quickly is um, there are challenges, though, in circularity and sustainability implementations. And we need to understand what those challenges are. Um, and we really, really need to call out that elephant in the room. Why should you be practicing circularity? Uh, there are great things about circularity and it's going to change the world. But why have we not made any progress? And that part of it, why that becomes important is because understanding the challenges will help you become more successful. So um, um, why, why, why is it that you practice circularity? Is it because everyone is doing it? So let us also do it. Is it because of regulation, government, organization pressure? And this applies to all of you actually who are on the webinar. Is my business partner forcing it? Are experts like people on this call telling you to save the world and you're doing it for values and morality reason? Um, or uh, customers are wanting it? or competition is taking away business with the circularity story, or the last but not the least, business transformation. One thing I know for sure is that a lot of people on this webinar are still not fully convinced about circularity, and they're still trying to figure out what that means for them and their organization. And I can bet there's not one single common reason across all the people on this webinar about pursuing circularity in your companies and organization. So why am I talking about this? Who am I to talk about it? Just to give you a brief background, I used to be a consultant supply chain, been there for a while, and I have practiced circularity and green practices in about 75 countries, including many developing countries. And then I became an entrepreneur and uh, a green entrepreneur started a reverse logistics company and uh, um, second company again in predictive diagnostic in maintenance again focusing on circularity and ended up publishing a book called sense and sustainability so um, i am going to be the realist uh, for you so let's start from the top <clears throat> let's talk about ceos why uh, what happens when they believe what will happen if they're not going to do circularity? And this survey just came out by KPMG. It's fresh um, off the press uh, just two or three weeks ago. Let me share some data. I'll give you a second to go through this. The reason what will happen if they don't do circularity? And if you'll see the slide, you will see one key thing popping out of this. They talk about recruitment challenges, competitor gain. They also talk about many of the CEOs are worried about their own job if they did not push circularity. What you're missing in this slide is the climate part of it, the um, uh, how it's going to change the sector, how it's going to change their business. They're talking about very, very tactical things at this moment. And what that leads to is, I want to share a slide with you. Is on if you see on this um, on the spectrum of risk management to impact impact on the right, you will see that at a minimum level, companies will end up doing very limited measures, do no harm measures, react to trends, just uh, donate resources, volunteer, and if you start to move towards more impact, you'll see in the middle. There is some effort. Uh, you're delivering something around the ESG and circularity goals, and uh, you're in, having some effort around uh, circularity, but not efficient, not sufficient. And then the extreme next, next level is where you holistically integrate uh, circularity and ESG into your business. Why this is important is because 70 to 80% of the people are on the minimum to the common level. And why that becomes important is because both minimum 
and common uh, where, where companies are, organizations are, that's a cost. Only when you reach up to that next level is where circularity and sustainability practices become profitable. So now you know when you're looking at doing something and it being perceived as a cost got very clearly reflected in the survey. Let me share that with you. So why are CEOs not delivering on uh, ESG and circularity initiatives? If you look at all of this, this is purely driven by a cost mentality. Just to give you an example, other pressing business economic matters. So that's, we are moving away. Lack of budget to invest into ESG transformation. Metrics are not there. So you see how their focus on this being a cost is hindering a lot of the progress that are being made. So what this creates is, let me share with you, what are some of the characteristics of this challenge? And I'm gonna quickly go through them. One, uh, the characteristics are, it's been pushed by activists, scientists and governments, businesses and organizations are not owning it. Um, the business case is unclear. They're inconsistent standards, difficult to measure, monitor and regulate. Not on the CEO's agenda, organization misalignment. There is an inertia. It's amorphous, big. Where do I begin? It is a next wave opportunist trying to make a quick buck so the genuine parties are moving away. So what happens with the results? They're predictable. Greenwashing and brownwashing. I know all of you have heard of greenwashing, but there is a term called brownwashing. And this brownwashing is when companies, particularly electric utility companies, underreport their circularity goals because the shareholders think or perceive that doing more circularity and sustainability measure means the costs are going up. So rather than answer those shareholders about, no, that's not true, they just underreport their performances. So now you have a new term. There is a deliberate ambiguity um, and, and it has been done for a reason, opportunist. Um, you must have heard of uh, carbon offsets and uh, how carbon offsets are being purchased and organizations are not transforming at all. And there is uh, more harm than doing it the old way. So, and then funny accounting, how do you account for some of these things? So these are the results that become very, very predictable. So what's not going to work? Let's talk about that really quickly. Asking suppliers and partners in the supply chain to fill out a survey, okay? And, um, and, and, and then feeling good about it. Thinking of circularity as a silo departmental function using legacy metrics like IRR and ROI to measure sustainability and circularity, buying carbon offsets and thinking they are get out of jail free cards and creating a separate sustainability or department or a function and not thinking holistically. The good news is there are winds of change. A study of studies about 245 summary, very few found negative correlation between ESG, circularity, and profitability. 45% of the CEOs believe actually that um, ESG, and ESG, take a, sticking a step back, environmental, social, and governance. Think of it as circularity being part of the ESG umbrella, okay? So 45% up from 37% a year ago, and 62% um, are saying that they will invest at least 6% of their revenue to enable sustainability. And the business case is becoming very, very evident. And, in all, and I'm not gonna spend time on each and every one of them, but image, operations, maintenance, employee satisfaction, environment and health, suppliers, legal implications, shareholders, valuations are going up, green financing is going through the roof. And uh, as a matter of fact, Citibank has already set aside $100 billion environmental finance uh, goal. And HSBC has already allocated about a trillion dollar by 2030. So business case is becoming much more stronger. So where do you go from here? 
Where do you go from here is what we are proposing is a framework. Being a consultant, I've seen many cookie cutter frameworks, but the energy utility needs something that is very, very specific. And there are key things I wanna identify in this one, and this is part of a white paper, is this establishing a vision and goals, and then identifying the strategic contours that are so relevant to your environment, to your country. It could be the political climate, it could be um, a public versus private utilities and the service provider, identifying those strategic con uh, contours, and then getting into holistically following the product life cycle when you talk about circularity, but it has to start from the top. And if you need more details of each and every step, we will be sharing with you the white paper. So what do we do immediately? What do we do in terms of the next steps? Get your champion. Add circularity to your CEO's agenda and align the incentives. Extremely important, you align the incentives. Understand your strategic contours and think holistically. Think from the, from the beginning all the way to the end. Uh, let me give you an example. Electric meters, a new one in the US, it ranges from $30 to $300. Um, and if you talk about its asset recovery at the end of the cycle, you get for scrap maybe five cents uh, per unit. Uh, transformers are already being refurbished in the developing countries, so that is already part of the process. But now, if you think the value of electric meter holistically, let's talk about ethical supplier selection when you're buying it. That reduces your cost by up to 10%. If you do accurate forecasting, uh, your inventory can be reduced by 15%. Um, your, green, your green warehouses can reduce your power consumption by 20 to 25%. And with ethical products sourced from suppliers, electric meter, and we have examples there, your scrap is being reduced by three to 5%. Mm -hmm. A predictive diagnostic can increase the meter life by about 20 to 40%. Now imagine this value adding up across the entire supply chain dwarfs that asset recovery that you're gonna do only by recycling that electric meter or any other product in the utility. So measure the right things, put the right measures and incentives in place. Profitability and sustainability are symbiotic. Build that business case and integrate sustainability and circularity results in your business rhythm. And finally, engage, educate internal and external ecosystem. It's not an easy task. Remember three Ps of a circularity warrior, patience, perseverance, and persuasion. And my final slide actually is a little bit of, um, um, you may think it's strange, but I believe in it. Remember uh, quality? At one point of time, quality was everywhere. We were teaching quality in colleges. We were teaching quality everywhere. It was a standalone discipline, but now quality is in everything we do. We don't need to teach quality. We assume it's going to be there. If we kill the world's sustainability and we bake it into everything we do, we don't need a separate word called sustainability or circularity. So if we achieve that goal, we are great. With that, Raj? Thanks, Atendra. If you just keep going with the slides. So I'm going to just go through some examples very quickly so that uh, you get a sense of what's happening in. Uh, in circular economy, go ahead. So uh, one of the most common circular economy examples is the sharing economy, um, where basically Uber, Airbnb, Lyft, all these companies, eBay, are uh, reusing or repurposing, making use of waste resources, whether it's uh, transportation or lodging space or, or things, stuff, right? Go ahead. That's one second. The next one is product as a service, where all these companies, uh, Philips and Interface started this concept. Uh, Xerox and Canon uh, are no longer sell selling printers, they're selling uh, ink. Uh, Interface is not selling carpet, they're selling uh, uh, soft carpet space, if you will, in the form of tiles. Philips is selling lighting, not selling light bulbs. Go ahead. 
in the utility sector, here's some few a few examples. Uh, ABB Power Grids and Standard Recycling started a long-term uh, partnership in 2020 uh, around uh, transformer replacement and uh, greener design. And 99% of their material gets uh, used in some valuable way. Although uh, energy generation is a, is a last life kind of uh, exercise. So you don't want to do too much of that. You want to try and get more value out of that material, but it is better than burying it in the landfill. Go ahead. Uh, General Electric has been uh, evaluating vegetable oil for transformers uh, for cooling. And, and you can see the, the benefits here, the performance benefits, the extended life, the maintenance aspects that they're experiencing by doing this. Go ahead. Um, in Australia, a utility scale solar project um, had an economic value of 600,000 Australian dollars. They include, improved soil quality and yield, and you can see the stats on the amount of waste they diverted from landfill by uh, coming up with better uses for it. And finally, I think my last slide. Oh, fly ash in construction. That's fine. Fly ash in construction is is uh, has been around for quite a few years, and and putting it into concrete. Uh, go ahead. Go to the next slide. And then the final one is the smart meter that Hitendo kind of alluded to. In 2020, NL started um, offering the smart meter. They expect to get the 8.2 million units by 2026, and you can see some of the uh, recycling or circular economy benefits of their smart meter and the circular system they're trying to create. And with that, uh, Nate, I hand it back over to you. Perfect. Thanks so much. And kindly, if our next speakers would come off uh, uh, mute and turn on your videos. And also wanted to thank Raj and Hitendra, particularly as a number of things you mentioned, but one thing I'd like to kindly point out is the, the need and desire for senior leadership buy-in to access the full potential of circularity. And that's increasingly going to be a concern of executives globally and leadership as uh, sustainability goals fall alongside financial goals uh, in driving decisions uh, and then also merit and more. Uh, next up, kindly have two speakers from Salt River Project. We have Sam uh, Katrazula, who's manager of sustainable, sustainable Solutions, and then also Tim Webley, who is supervisor of the Transformer Shop. Go ahead, Sam and Tim, take it away. Are you seeing my screen? Not yet. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, see it now. Yep. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Tim Webley. I am a supervisor of the Transformer Shop Salt River Project. Um, kind of give you an idea of what we do uh, to try to recycle and reuse uh, the transformers that have come in from the field that they had uh, bought. Uh, this first slide is a picture of some of my guys. Uh, there's only eight pictures, eight, eight pictured. I have 12, actually. I've got uh, four journeyman level uh, workers, they've gone through a four-year apprenticeship, uh, on-the-job training and electrical theory training. I got four guys that are uh, distribution uh, equipment repairmen is what they're called. They've gone through a two-year apprenticeship with uh, electrical theory and uh, some on-the-job training. And then I've got four of the guys that are helpers. Um, and uh, they uh, actually, with the, with the supply chain and stuff like that right now, they've kind of become some rock stars around here. So this will kind of give you an idea of the size of our operation. Um, our core functions are evaluate for salvage and repair all 15 KV rated distribution type equipment removed from service, uh, return refurbished equipment to warehouse stock to be used again in SRP system, recycle all equipment and materials received, including reusable parts, transformer oil and metals, uh, support SRP's core values of leaner, greener and customer centric. The picture there on the right, you know, that, like I say, hopefully that gives you an idea of the size of our operation. Um, the, the building there, that square in the middle, that is actually our shop. That's the, the portion of the shop that uh, we, um, that's where we're located. And maybe the cars will give you an idea of the size of the building. So uh, the top right up there, that's our receiving area. That's where all the equipment that comes in from the field uh, that the line crews or substation crews will bring in, um, where the guys will actually go out and start evaluating what we want to do with it. Below that is our oil processing area. We have uh, six 5,000 gallon tanks. 
Uh, we've got, uh, right now we have five tanks that are for good oil, one tank that is for uh, trash oil. We are going to be changing that out soon because we are not using as much good oil with uh, getting rid of all the oil breakers. Uh, now that we're running going into uh, SF6 gas breakers, we don't give substation maintenance as much oil as we did in the past. So um, we're kind of moving on to, to more waste oil processing. Uh, to the right of that actually is our little PCB area. That's just a staging area for before we, we test and, and process those PCBs. Below that is our equipment repair holding area. Uh, on the on the right of that is our miscellaneous equipment. Those are switches, cat banks, uh, a lot of different stuff, uh, 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 overhead capacitors, overhead switches, things like that. To the left in that square, uh, there's transformers that are waiting to be repaired in the bottom as they flow up. Uh, those are transformers repaired, transformers ready for paint. And then the finished product is <clears throat> in the bottom where it says repaired equipment warehouse. Uh, so the first thing, the first process is what the guys will do is they'll they'll bring in the transformers coming from the field, have a look at them for race, uh, rust, age, PCB content, absolute uh, absolute equipment. Um, we used to get rid of a, we used to recycle a lot of our equipment with outside vendors. We haven't been doing that so much anymore, just because of the supply chain crisis. We're pretty much, unless it's unrepairable, we're pretty much keeping everything. But these guys are pretty good at it. Um, they'll send the ones that uh, they think that look good. They uh, again age. Uh, they get pretty good at it over time. They can kind of look at them and tell whether or not we're going to try to repair them or if we're going to we're going to send them off for recycling. And so here, they're just guys are just loading a truck on the top picture there uh, to go out to an outside vendor that'll actually they actually will spend time. From my understanding, they'll spend time and they'll they'll retank these transformers. They'll take the good tanks that don't have a lot of rust and and actually cut the lids off and re, uh, replace the, the cores uh, and reuse them, send them back out in the field. We, uh, we just don't have the manpower or the time to do that really. Um, but the bottom uh, picture there is uh, Dan. He's actually testing a three-phase transformer, pad mount transformer back there. We actually, with the computer program that we have, the engineers here at Salt River have put in a program that'll kind of give us an idea of what value is left in the transformer. Um, we'll do a uh, we'll do a full load and a no loss uh, test on it, and uh, you know with the installation value and different things, and it'll kind of spit a number out at us whether it's worthy to be put more money back into it to put it back in the field or just send it to be recycled. And uh, you know some of the calculations are new transformer costs, average life expectancy, cost of replacement parts, parts labor costs, and average life expectancy. We, a lot of this stuff, when we get these transformers in like this, if, uh, if there's good parts to this transformer, we'll actually, we'll, we'll actually keep them. The guys will actually salvage them. And they also have gotten very good at that. They know the, you know, you work in here long enough, you kind of learn what parts are, are more valued than others. And, and we keep a lot of those to, to reuse them. We try to buy uh, as little new as possible. So uh, here's the repair line. This is some of the things that the repair guys do. They re-gasket, process oil, replace parts as necessary, cosmetic work. The top left, that picture there, that's our oil processor. That's actually going to be replaced. That's a 32-year-old oil processor that's still working, but we're having a hard time finding parts for it anymore. We're actually having a brand new one come in in February, and uh, we're obviously very excited about that. Uh, down below that is our tank farm. You can see there's six 5,000 gallon tanks there. Right now, as I said before, the, the, the first five here are uh, for good oil, uh, the process of good oil, and then the last one is for junk oil. And I have been a super, I've worked in the shop since about 2010, and we have not bought one gallon of new oil since, uh, since I've been here. So every, all the oil that we use is, is completely, is refurbished by the, the, the uh, degasifier up there and filtered and, and we use all of our own oil. We also supply oil to, uh, to, out to other people in the company, uh, especially the substation maintenance for their LTCs. Uh, we give a lot to them. We used to, like I said before, we used to give a lot to them with their uh, uh, oil breakers, but they're just kind of, oil breakers are not obsolete these days. In fact, I don't know if we have any left in the system at all. So, but they'll, uh, they also do cosmetic work on them. Um, they, uh, They'll, any bushings that look like they're in bad shape, we'll try to replace them. That's one of the things we do buy a lot new. We'll buy bushings new. Um, 
you know, a lot of the bushings that come in, they'll be filled and, and, and kind of expanded with oil and things. So the bushings on a, on a pad mount transformer is one of the things we replace a lot. But they'll actually do bondo work and sand and, and treat and uh, get rid of rust, things like that, try to get them back in the field, as many in the field as we possibly can. So this is Gamaleo. He's actually out there. He's getting ready to, you can see Bondo actually on that transformer where the guys are done. There's dents and dings and different things in there. And, and so uh, he's uh, going to have that prep and get it ready for paint. They'll paint it, relabel it. We'll put all of our warning stickers and different things uh, uh, back on it. And uh, by the time we're done with it, it'll look pretty much brand new. These are some of the parts that we save. Um, this is where the guys, like I said before, the, the guys get good at what we know we need. Uh, we'll salvage a lot of uh, what we call miscellaneous equipment, which is again, like cat banks, uh, overhead and underground, different switches, dog houses, things like this. And when we're processing them as they come in, if they're rusted, we'll save the parts, put them in this room here. This is just some of our, some of the parts we have. We have a lot more than that, but they'll, uh, we'll save fuses. We, uh, we actually will test and put fuses back in the field. We save lids, seals, doors, handle switches, pen bolts, cannon plugs, anything we can. And there's a lot of times we're out in the field, we can actually go out, we can replace a door if a transformer's been broken into or if it's rusted. We can actually go out and replace doors, we can replace seals, we do the whole thing, but we, we keep them. And you can see on the right, there's just some of the doors I see looks like there's a switch door, there's some transformers doors, a bunch of other stuff, but our, our single face pad mount stuff is in another area, but we keep a, a ton of that stuff too. And as it comes in, you know, the guys, if the sill or the lid is rusted out completely, we can actually take one from another transformer that we've salvaged and rebuild the transformer, and basically make it new again. This is some of our miscellaneous equipment. Overhead switches, cow switches, overhead and underground cap banks, pulling enclosures, live front and dead front switches, fuses, and then of course field repairs. And uh, the journeyman will actually go out and do a lot of those field repairs. To, and then again, and you can see there's a lot of equipment here that we have not processed, but you can see that there's a lot of good doors and different things. You know, you can take different parts off uh, of different those pieces of equipment, save them, and reuse them later on. And and like I said, you know, one of the things is, is the guys get really good at it and they're, they're aware of what's out there, what's used a lot, what is the, the equipment types that we have the most of. So those are the things they kind of put preference on saving. If you saved everything, you know, we'd be buried and we'd be buried with metal. So um, they kind of, you know, the, their experience is, is very appreciated around here. So did you want to talk on this, Sam, or do you want me to do this? No, I can cover it. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so how do I get started or grow my program? Uh, new programs, allocate resources with approved allocated budget, identify a leadership sponsor, inspect waste streams, identify disposition partners for non-landfill waste, create and provide basic recycling training to field employees, identify opportunities for refurbishment, transformers, line hardware, et cetera, Outline cost model for select opportunity, labor materials cost to refurbish versus purchase, new, not applicable, applicable for supply chain constrained items, and identify disposition partners for non-landfill waste. So that's, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions in the end. So Sam, you got anything to add? Yeah, Tim, thank you very much. So um, one thing that uh, the previous, uh, slides and also our slides covered is um, the idea of evaluating an item for refurbishment. And it's changed over the years. So for many years, it was about the time and materials spent on an item being a net zero. So you're not losing money versus purchasing new. And that paradigm has really shifted for SRP and other organizations. So uh, it may be that you can't get the component and you need to refurbish it. Uh, that's something that we're do looking at at SRP. Uh, so that analysis, I think that's key. And that's a, a key paradigm shift for everyone in the industry and other industries is uh, refurbishing items doesn't always have to be at a net zero. It also helps divert waste from the waste stream, um, as well as those supply chain issues, supply chain challenges that, that we have. Uh, so something else to, to think about as you're looking into refurbishment. One thing Tim had uh, mentioned 
is when you're getting your program started, or also if you have an existing program, it's important to have a process where you're reviewing all of the waste uh, that comes in from the field, power plants, even if you're uh, non-utilities. When you're looking at the waste, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're reviewing the waste, then that provides the opportunity to see what's coming through and look for those opportunities for uh, refurbishment and also diversion of different types of materials. So a couple other things to think about. Uh, Nate, I think we'll turn it back over to you. It's perfect. Excellent. Thank you, Sam and Tim. I really appreciated what you're mentioning about the and showing about the comprehensiveness of your asset recovery plans, um, the variety of different pieces and components that are able to uh, source and store, uh, warehouse and reuse, and then also uh, uh, significant and major compliments kindly for at least 12 years of full oil uh, circularity with not purchasing any new oil. That is an extremely uh, impressive feat uh, to have um, that uh, capability and then also leadership and metrics. So thank you kindly for sharing and I'm looking forward to following up a little bit more in Q&A. Very much, excellent, thank you. And so thinking uh, from transformers and grid connected systems, we'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to a question of energy access. So specifically solar home systems and mini grids. And so kindly if uh, Grayson uh, Metali, head of Africa operations for energy, energy access, uh, if you'd like to close out uh, the presentation portion, we'll move into Q&A. Awesome, thanks a lot, Nate. Um, so I'll quickly share my screen. All right. Um, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Looks good. Awesome. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Grayson Matili. I am head of Africa Operations from NG Energy Access. Um, I'm going to take you a bit through uh, what we do as NG Energy Access and um, some of the circularity initiatives that we have seen um, incorporated into our operations um, over the years. So. EEA or NG Energy Access as we call it is a, a vertically integrated organization uh, that was formed in 2020 as a result of um, uh, the integration of three companies uh, or the acquisition of three companies, um, the brand Mobisol, um, uh, Power Corner and Phoenix International. And uh, as a result of this integration, um, a, a company was formed that uh, is able to provide uh, a full scale and a full range uh, solution uh, of solar home systems all the way to mini grids um, based on a model that is, uh, is around mobile money as a means of payment um, and also consumer financing. Um, so payment on installments on the assets that are put in the market, as well as uh, support and uh, service support and warranty. Um, so the two main brands around NG Energy Access are MISOL, which uh, reflects to the uh, solar home system business or the decentralized uh, solar uh, equipment and assets, and uh, MISOL Grid, which refers mostly to the grids um, and, and the mini grids that we build. So there are competencies uh, uh, that, that, um, that we think are pretty important uh, for us and uh, have been uh, core to the, uh, to the performance and uh, the achievement of the mission of EEA, which as you can see above is to deliver life-changing, affordable, reliable and sustainable energy solutions uh, with exceptional customer experience. Why affordable is because we sell most of these products, we install most of these systems in um, rural Africa where um, affordability is of great concern. So product quality, uh, the geographical footprint that we have, which I'll speak about in the next slides as well, um, customer experience being at the core of our um, uh, competencies, uh, you know, cre the creation of a Pan-African brand that is existing in several markets in Africa, nine markets now, or nine countries in Africa now, um, having a fully uh, vertically integrated business that does um, everything, handles everything from uh, product design to, um, to supply chain logistics to uh, last mile distribution uh, and to reach the customer. Um, a, a set of products that are complementing each other and uh, with a view of a growing uh, product portfolio and a more uh, integrated product portfolio over the coming years. Uh, digital tools that also enable us 
uh, to reach our customers and to maintain the value of our assets uh, while in the field. And uh, the portion on customer financing, which allows for uh, daily, even monthly uh, installments on, uh, you know, on payment for the assets that are being installed. So at the center of all this is the people. Enian, uh, Enian Lasso is a Yoruba word, which simply means I am clothed in people or clothed in human. Uh, so it, it speaks to the support system, which is uh, the team that we have in the, in the countries where we operate. Uh, so currently in 13 countries, none of which are African markets, uh, 400 shops, a network of 400 shops around the country, around uh, 1,738 employees, of which uh, 1,600 are African, um, and a network of about 5,000 agents doing um, well, uh, sales and installation and maintenance uh, of the assets in the field. Um, so this uh, boldly speaks to uh, some of our core values, uh, which are around uh, perform being performance driven, um, you know, creating a one team, uh, customer centricity, integrity, and, uh, and boldness. Um, so, as a result of uh, this formation, uh, there is impact that we can speak to uh, where we see a very high customer satisfaction rate, um, especially with the products and services that uh, we've been able to put in the market. Um, about 8 million people impacted in, in total um, and uh, about 32 megawatts of uh, solar capacity installed. That's both for the decentralized assets and the mini grids in total and about uh, 1 million tons of CO2 emissions uh, saved by 2021. And this is in compensation of the assets uh, and uh, more cleaner and more renewable energy that is being put in the markets. Uh, and as a result of this, we are able to contribute um, to, the, uh, to the growth and uh, 12 sustainable development goals, which speaks to the ESG um, aspects of our business. So speaking of the assets, um, so we had a more disintegrated product portfolio by 2020 before the integration um, of these three companies happened. And uh, today we have a lineup of products that um, ranges anywhere from 10 watts uh, Pico product to a 600 kilowatt uh, mini grid. Um, and, and these are like uh, you know, semi-big plants that can serve the needs uh, and, uh, and economic needs of uh, villages even. The 600 uh, kilowatt big, uh, mini grid, the biggest that we have is installed in uh, Lolwe Island in Uganda and is able to propagate economic activities um, around fishing by providing um, ice you know, generated from a big refrigerator uh, that is uh, being run by the mini grid or by running um, electric motorboats um, along uh, Lake Victoria uh, for more efficient and clean uh, fishing activities uh, and, and, so, and, and additional activities around that. Our target is to have a more uh, fully integrated products portfolio uh, with a more cohesive uh, product lineup on the lower range, um, and then an optimized uh, mini grid and SBS uh, solution. So this is a more home centric and uh, solar business um, systems uh, ranging uh, from uh, one kilowatt, uh, three kilowatt, five kilowatt, uh, and, and, and maybe then 10. And uh, to increase uh, or to accelerate our involvement in the productive use uh, of energy appliances and services. So speak of uh, solar water pumps, that can um, assist with irrigation, looking at the climate change um, scenarios that we have seen around Africa. Um, of recently, we've seen a case in Kenya where almost 18 months of, uh, of rain have been missed, uh, and this has caused uh, drought. So such products could actually create a big impact in those markets. And then venturing beyond just normal energy and looking into biodigesters uh, and, and also um, uh, other uh, financial or finance related aspects. So our supply chain um, <clears throat> for these nine markets uh, is, is um, you know, the forward outlook of the supply chain incorporates the, the most important element of circularity. Uh, which is the reverse logistics. 
And you can see that for most of the, uh, the products that we put in the field, uh, going through our warehouses and then going through our delivery systems and distribution network um, to reach our 400 shops uh, around the countries and then uh, being picked up by our sales team or our installation and contractors and maintenance teams. Uh, and then these products can actually reach uh, the customer. And then the same route is followed when we are uh, implementing some of the take back initiatives um, to get the products back uh, from the customers. And I will speak to some of those um, initiatives that, that we have implemented that have helped us uh, to achieve a certain scale of uh, circularity within this um, sector and the business. So speaking of the circularity uh, pillars, um, so we we do practice or uh, four of these pillars and I think uh, circularity has uh, a very broad um, application as mentioned also by the previous uh, speakers. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it starts all the way from uh, product design and uh, design for circularity. But then there is other aspects that help to keep the product as long as possible uh, in use. So warranty, uh, repair and refurbishment, um, and these extend the life of the product in the, in the field um, before it, it, it even reaches like the last uh, stage, which is disposal or uh, recycling. And um, looking at these pillars, um, for us uh, at EEA, some of the capabilities that we have seen um, around warranty management, for example, we are able to provide long-term warranty for our products up to four years. Um, so a kit, uh, whatever, you know, whatever happens to the product while in the field, we are able to actually visit this customer or ask the customer to bring the product back to any of our shop networks. Um, and they can receive a free swap uh, for a product that is in warranty. And even if they're out of warranty, uh, they can uh, pay a service fee uh, for a non-warranty setup that will allow us to, you know, to keep the customer happy. And at the same time, extend the life of the product by swapping the faulty component. Uh, with a call center capacity in each country, uh, we are also able to tackle some of these uh, product-related issues uh, remotely. And as a result of this, we see uh, a very big project, a transversal project was launched within EEA um, to, to basically tackle uh, a number of uh, uh, points in the value stream, in the warranty value stream, which I will speak to in the next slide, uh, a very high customer satisfaction rate um, and uh, possibilities and improvements on the forecasting for spare parts. Uh, and a more optimized uh, spare part availability because we are able to predict to some extent when the product will break down um, and when we can extend the warranty uh, for our customers. And on the repairs and refurbishment, um, there is a setup of formal repair technicians who are trained by, uh, by us uh, through our academy as one of the capacities that we have internally. Uh, about 2,500 of those uh, who are commission-based. And um, through the call center, these cases are channeled to these technicians in the field and the technicians can actually visit the customer and provide an in-field diagnosis of the asset. Um, and all the customer can actually bring in uh, the product uh, to one of our centers. Um, and this remote troubleshooting actually accounts or solves uh, around uh, 30 uh, to 40 percent of the product issues that we see in the field already. Um, and uh, each country is equipped uh, or has the capacity of uh, a warehouse uh, where we, uh, you know, ranging from um, anywhere from 500 uh, square meters to maybe uh, 2,000 square meters, depending on the uh, volumes uh, that are pushing through the uh, the warehouses in the countries, and uh, retro this warehouse uh, warehousing facility is retro retrofitted with a refurbishment um, capacity. So basically, um, uh, we can we are able to do uh, uh, diagnosis and uh, refurbishment of products down to component level. So we can literally. Uh, you know, strip off the PCB of the product and uh, check the circuitry uh, bit by bit, do uh, soldering and desoldering, um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and also um, exchange some teeny tiny capacitors and components from the PCB and, and uh, put it back in the product. And this product goes back into the market uh, where it can be used as a swap product or a swap component, uh, or it can be resold. 
uh, four out of the nine markets that uh, that we have are already reselling uh, refurbished kits at a lower price. Um, and we are uh, slowly approaching that, uh, that tipping point, um, the 70-30 split, uh, which is considered to be sort of an, uh, the industry uh, target, uh, where 70% of the products uh, that are used for swap uh, have to be refurbished, or at least you know, companies should aim to achieve that. And uh, with these facilities, we are currently running at a utilization rate of uh, about 90%. And um, disposal and recycling is basically the last bit um, of our circularity capabilities. And here uh, we work with uh, vetted partners, um, so external partners um, who help us to actually collect the products uh, that are broken um, and, uh, or end of life products and uh, dismantle them and um, sustainably uh, or maybe circularly um, dispose them of. Um, at the same time, um, we are also co-chairing the circularity working group at Gogla. Gogla is the industry association uh, for off-grid uh, solar. And this has given us a bit uh, an additional edge because we get to also um, uh, participate uh, in, in some of the cutting edge and, uh, and, uh, and important decisions that can influence the circularity initiatives um, of the sector. Uh, one of those very important initiatives that we've been working on recently is the Kenya Solar Waste uh, Collective, which is now slowly evolving into the first uh, producer responsibility organization um, in Kenya for the renewable energy uh, sector. Uh, and, and this has, and, and, and EEA has been uh, one of those uh, founding members, which started um, initially as an MOU between six companies. Uh, and is slowly progressing in line with the EPR regulations in Kenya. And some of the other activities that we are also looking into around recycling and disposal is um, uh, establishing our robust um, uh, waste management policy, which was recently uh, created um, as one of the outputs of the uh, circularity working group and uh, battery cell repurposing trials uh, that we are looking into. So, um, the impact of our involvement or you know, our look into um, circularity and recycling activities is that uh, we are now able to estimate at least how much waste we will build up based on the products or number of products that we are putting in the field um, over the next uh, few years. And also, um, we are also able to a certain extent uh, to determine the split uh, between the products that uh, that will come back, so PV panels, batteries, um, or cables and and plastics, um, and as well, uh, we are able to attract uh, your partners to work with in in the markets. Although there are some markets which are still proving um, you know a challenge to get partners, and uh, because of this, we have also been able to uh, to dispose or to recycle um, effectively and efficiently around um, seven hundred and ninety tons of waste across the nine markets. So why look into the warranty value chain? Uh, we speak of the warranty value chain um, from all the angles that we can um, imagine in the organization. We try to consider uh, our policy with the customers, our interface with the suppliers, because the suppliers provide us with warranty terms. And we have um, an, extend, an extension of those warranty terms provided to our customers. Um, we have uh, customer experience uh, touch points that we need to uh, put into consideration. Uh, the comprehensive review of our reverse logistics, uh, testing efficiency, as mentioned earlier, we are currently utilizing about 90% of our capacity. So it's a question of whether uh, we need to grow that capacity or are we reaching that point where we, for example, have to converge some of these activities so we can leverage on economies of scale. Um, and then um, the, the intention is also to track the cost of warranty at a very granular uh, level, at the you know, organizational granular level, and uh, to be able to, uh, to escalate and to resolve some of these warranty claims um, uh, that, that we receive. Um, and, um, and, and so, as I mentioned earlier, um, this, the, the, the uh, warranty for us is an important uh, tool 
to actually uh, improve or increase the circularity of, uh, of our products. Um, and and um, the supplier warranty in this case plays a very vital role um, in achieving that uh, because in some cases, uh, products that we put in the market um, are, are, uh, are very, uh, should I say like short, uh, short lived. <laughs> Um, and, and we need a way to, to be able to return those products and to, um, and, and to claim uh, some of the warranty compensation. And Grayson, if you'd like to kindly take a minute or two to uh, conclude, thanks. Yeah, no problem, thanks. Um, repair and refurbishment. Um, so some of the key facts around repair and refurbishment is that, um, that we have a, um, a number of uh, trained and certified installation and maintenance technicians uh, in the countries uh, who are certified through our academy and they're able to do minor troubleshooting and um, you know, through the call center and the support that they have remotely with the digital tools that we have to monitor the performance of the system of the asset while in the field and uh, to also do minor repairs while in the field. So connectors, uh, doing a bit of soldering and dis uh, desoldering and pins and swapping of uh, small components. Um, so, but the major refurbishment activities happen at the centralized warehouse, uh, which uh, work under a hybrid uh, ownership model. Uh, so sometimes owned by us or sometimes the entire warehousing functionality is outsourced. But here we are able to drill down to the PCBA and component level uh, and swap some of the faulty components in there. Um, products are tested and recategorized. Um, so we have uh, three main categories or four. Uh, so we have good as new products. These are products that we can actually send back to the market or we can also let resell or we can confidently use them as swaps. Um, refurbished A, B products. Uh, so these are equally um, or close to good. Uh, we use these sometimes for internal consumption as demo units, uh, or we resell them to uh, to employees um, who can you know um, take advantage of the residual value of the lifetime of the product. And then the end of life products are the products that you know end up being recycled. Mm -hmm. And uh, the revaluation of these products is um, uh, system based and currently is about 10 to 50% of the COGS anywhere in that range. So that enables us to sell the products at a very subsidized uh, price. Um, and and uh, in the last end or in the tail end of the, of the life of the product, that is the end of life, uh, we salvage some of the components that we can eventually use uh, to repair other uh, PCBAs and products. Um, and uh, and we also um, have a reuse and repurposing um, example where we uh, we actually test uh, the integrity of the battery cells, uh, so of the batteries down to cell level. So we strip the packs, um, test the cells, and any cells that we can get are actually used to um, to reassemble um, other products like power banks, which we can then resell. So the last bit is the recycling part. As I mentioned earlier, we work with partners, uh, external partners um, who are acquired through a vigorous and comprehensive uh, due diligence process. So we check for permits, um, permits to collect, to store, to sort and transport and dispose. Uh, we check for business permits. Um, uh, we check that they have you know, a full um, value chain utilization um, of the materials that they extract from our products. Uh, and and uh, the prioritization of these products is mostly based on lead acid batteries first, uh, and and of course lithium batteries. Although for lithium batteries there is a very limited recycling capacity in Africa, maybe even none. Um, and and so most of these batteries are sent back either to Belgium, um, Umicore, um, or Europe. Uh, and for plastics and cables, uh, these. Uh, are you know in most cases able to be recycled up to like ninety percent of the value um, within the countries where we operate. Um, so the the transboundary movement of goods maybe one important point to mention here is that the transboundary uh, transboundary movement of hazardous waste um, is also posing a, a limitation uh, to accessing potential waste partners in other countries. So for instance, in this case, if we have a good partner in Nigeria that we are, you know, we are working with, 
we are not uh, fully able or um, you know we have to comply to the Basel Convention uh, or the Bamako Convention uh, to move those hazardous waste, uh, hazardous waste say from Benin to Nigeria. Uh, and that is a very long and, and, and pretty expensive process as well. Uh, um, so this is one of the limitations I wanted to mention here. But in general, we received the damaged item from the field. Uh, we diagnosed the product. Uh, we check whether the product is repairable or not. And if we can recover uh, any value from the product, we do that. And uh, if we can reuse uh, the products or the assets, then we reuse them. Uh, for everything that we are not able to reuse or to recover, that is what contributes to the end of life uh, pool, which goes into disposal or recycling. So um, there are uh, definitely opportunities um, uh, that, that we think, uh, you know, for, for, for someone who, who wants to get started or to get involved in the, in the uh, in, in circularity, uh, especially when dealing with decentralized assets. Uh, and number one is uh, opportunities to understand better the economies of e-waste. Um, so uh, decentralized assets have a lot of positive and also negative fractions of waste. Um, and um, and I believe uh, one of the speakers from uh, from a uh, from the Arizona State University mentioned about the accounting um, of uh, of waste. So that's also um, I think I call it an opportunity because uh, once we crack that nut, it becomes easier to explain circularity uh, to CEOs and to other uh, top um, people in the organization. Um, we see opportunities around interoperability and modularity especially from the start and the design of the product uh, for easier uh, product uh, repairability and uh, even to create a, a standard measurement on how repairable a product is. Um, and uh, opportunities around convergence, the sector is converging in so many levels. Uh, so maybe a, a blue sky thinking around a centralized repair or refurbishment center um, and uh, collaborative take back initiatives. Um, instead of each company running a parallel supply chain or a parallel reverse logistics, um, it would be beneficial to leverage economies of scale and uh, to converge at some point. Um, and uh, we also see opportunities around involving the informal sector. So most of the companies operating in the renewable energy sector um, have their own uh, formal uh, structure and trainings and um, certified technicians, for example, but we do have informal um, technicians in the markets uh, who are able to repair smartphones uh, and other products that are, you know, are complementary or even very close in, um, in nomenclature to our existing renewable products. Um, and so, you know, uh, this can also help with um, establishing better recycling uh, infrastructure uh, and, and increase uh, the rate of circularity within the sector. Um, extended warranty. So this is a uh, warranty after warranty. Um, so when the warranty of your product expires, what next? And how do you position this service? Do you position it as a service or do you position it as a product? Uh, maybe attached uh, you know, to, to extended warranty as a service. So these are models that uh, are currently being tested. Um, and then uh, product design for circularity and uh, guidance, uh, you know, on practical manufacturing. So uh, manufacturing or convergence at the manufacturing level and uh, on the regulatory uh, framework, the support to navigate transboundary movement of uh, waste, I think would come um, a long way um, and, and there are opportunities there as well. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, and looking forward to further engagement in the dialogues. Over to you, Nate. Perfect. Thank you so much, Grayson. I really appreciated um, what you were sharing and showing with everyone about providing distributed access and most impressively the scale of your operations across uh, nine markets with over 2,500 repair technicians. The volume uh, and uh, to, to meet that scale while also keeping people-centric goals uh, at the core of your business. So I really appreciate that. Um, if I could kindly ask the, the panelists to come off mute and turn on your videos, and as we're transitioning to having the, the panelists on board to have a Q&A, 
Um, if USCA would kindly also open up the poll. And so folks attending today, we have a couple of basic questions based upon if you're currently uh, implementing um, circularity practices and if you have anything of interest uh, that was given today that you like more follow-up dialogue on. Uh, so USCA, if you kindly open up that poll. Excellent. And then as that's going, um, uh, I'll start to, to pose and ask some questions to folks. And then with panelists, uh, given the variety of questions we have, uh, we'll try to keep it to maybe 30 to 60 seconds for response. And then for attendees, if you would like to ask more questions, please put those into the Q&A feature of uh, Zoom. And we also follow up on all questions, even if we can't get to them uh, verbally today. So first, if I could actually per uh, Hitendra and Raj is, You've you know, worked across a number of different economic sectors, contributing to the inception and growth of circular principles in those sectors. Uh, what generalizable lessons or advice might you have for people to get started in the energy sector? Raj, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so great question. Um, I think a couple of things for lessons learned that we've experienced is the importance of uh, collaboration. So internal and external collaboration, finding those partners, Grayson talked about it, uh, Tim talked about it for SRP, um, inside the organization and really more importantly, outside the organization around the reverse logistics, around the value that you can extract from these uh, waste resources. So collaboration is one big lesson learned. The other one that I didn't really talk about much in my presentation is, uh, local and regional circles versus uh, national or global circles. So um, circular economy is an opportunity to create jobs locally and within the region uh, because these materials are already there. So um, the, the idea of trying to create local jobs and local capacity uh, building and, and workforce development, those are all opportunities that come from a local circular economy mindset. Uh, just, just to add to what Raj is saying, and I'll take 30 seconds. Very simple. Uh, first thing, find a sponsor in your company. Find a sponsor, ideally at the C-level. Then find one product, just one product, and map out the entire life cycle of the product. Um, and, and then build that business case and execute on that product around circularity. And once you're able to create that business case and the money that the, the value is there, all you need to do is take that same process model and just scale it to the other products. Keep on building on it. Keep on that platform. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. That pilot and scale approach and end-to-end -end life cycle with a project sponsor, I think that's uh, one thing we have seen across industries that work very well. Excellent. Thanks, you both. Uh, question, if I could, for uh, colleagues, uh, Tim and Sam at Solar River Project is I appreciated when you walked us through the transformer shop is you you know clearly outlined different activities, uh, services, repair and more that was being conducted inside the house versus what was being uh, hired out to a contractor. And I know Tim, in some of your remarks, you alluded to some things regarding um, uh, like a human resource volume of personnel, but there might be other factors and decisions for what you decide to do inside the house and outside the house. Can you talk a little bit more about how you made those decisions? Well, really, it, it comes down mostly to uh, amount of time. We kind of decided yeah. that we could rebuild more and be more productive, um, making more minor repairs than what they would be for major repairs. If we were to start retanking transformers, it would take the, you know, we'd be building you know, one transformer every day versus knocking out three or four a day. That's kind of the, that was kind of our thinking in that process. So um, there's other companies out there that are willing to take the time and they'll actually rebuild those transformers. So, you know, it just, it just made sense to do it that way. Yeah. And really good Nathan, one thing um, in regards to other things, not just transformers, is we found the logistics and the transportation where some of those items really eats into the time, the supply chain, and of course that value that's being offered. So that gets to be more difficult. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I understand and appreciate that. And looking at 
the the volume of assets that could be put back into commission and then uh, noting that the cost savings cost reduction and then also the expanded warehouse to have storm shock in case of severe issues or outages so i, I appreciate that thanks tam uh, tim and sam for sharing that with us um question grayson to you is you know looking from where your your organization was two years ago to now to going out to 2025 the assets are expanding rapidly as you are adding a bunch of new customers. Uh, can you, so you're at a unique position where you can really build circularity principles from day one or day zero, starting from the ground up. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you're planning that into um, your operations and business plan, even before you introduce assets to the field? So you're right, day zero planning is the key there. And um, we start all the way from uh, defining the policies um, mm -hmm. that help us to maintain circularity within the organization. Um, from day one, we start thinking about where are we gonna set up our refurbishment facility um, or our, uh, our tech center where we can do diagnosis, what kind of tools will we need? And uh, are we able to source the right kind of um, um, expertise within the local markets? So we think about all these things uh, in the design of our uh, supply chain and of our value chain um, for the product. And at the same time, uh, engagement and collaboration, as I mentioned earlier, has been very helpful. Uh, we talk to, um, to, uh, to, to the governments in these areas. Uh, they tell us, you know, um, do we have recyclers in the country? Uh, is it an area that we can maybe spend a bit more time to develop some relationships um, where we can end up having like good recy recyclers? We've done that before with some um, uh, two or three recyclers here in Tanzania, uh, where the, uh, you know, uh, through regular audits as per the policies that we have internally, we are able to even help them develop their own processes uh, and, to, uh, and to, to consider health and safety in all the aspects of their recycling activities as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the last bit is actually, you see, you see that the product uh, roadmap is uh, converging uh, in, in, in some of these cases, uh, where especially for the smallest units, which can, uh, can be a rather very large uh, footprint when they spread around the countries. Uh, in these cases, we start considering, um, you know, uh, converging the, this, uh, this, this layer uh, in order to also reduce the footprint. And by converging, we also uh, take into account, um, you know, uh, new designs for the product. Um, so you know, a new PCBA, for example, as opposed to having uh, a, a solar controller and a regulator board uh, separate, maybe put them under one PCB. And these are the kind of innovation that help us to, um, to also uh, take into account. And the last bit is the digital end, um, where we are able to track our assets as they go into the field. Uh, every customer we sell to, we have their KYC data, and we are also able to remotely, uh, via GSM and SIM card connectivity, uh, monitor the performance of the system. So we roughly have an idea when it might break down, and uh, it helps us to prepare better with resources. That's perfect. Thank you, Grayson. And I also uh, appreciated how everyone indicated the the the, vari the variety of stakeholders and the value of partnerships, and uh, what to take and and do in house versus hire out to external contractors and furthermore and partners. But then also the role of the vendor uh, and getting back to some of the thoughts and reflections on the the opportunity size and value that Tatendra and Raj shared uh, about expanding that network of folks leaning into the conversation. And that's furthermore, and just summarizing and closing remarks, is that um, uh, Kindly had Salt River Project as a vertically integrated utility, and you had NG Energy Access as a distributed uh, energy services provider, both with different needs, different challenges, and very different markets. And so everyone on the call here today is representing different institutions from around the globe, also with own unique cases, unique markets and more. And so I'm hoping today provided you with some general perspectives and kind of lessons and goals to get started. And then as follow up, uh, we'll be sending all attendees and registrants a note to complete a survey uh, at your voluntary discretion, which will then lead into a white paper and a call to action as we uh, embark on this journey together to enhance circularity in the um, 
uh, electric utility and energy industry, we're going to be combining lessons learned globally as we uh, transition into that low carbon and resilient and low cost future. Uh, so with that, friends, I'd like to, again, thank the panelists and thank USAID and USDA for providing the opportunity and for all of the attendees. Uh, thanks so much and have a, a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.